What do you feel was the, the biggest um, impact? We're working on the energy transition in those markets and to bring people together because we all have that common mission. And I think that's, that's a powerful driving force. The headline from your sector for 2023. I would say it's that corporate-led voluntary renewable procurement remains a significant driver for grid decarbonization globally. We're working on the energy transition in those markets and to bring people together because we all have that common mission and I think that's, that's a powerful driving force. Hello and welcome to Conversations on Climate, brought to you today in collaboration with the Yale School of Business and the Environment. We're recording from Yale's inspirational campus setting the stage for climate solutions going global. We'll share three compelling dialogues with distinguished Yale alumni who are pioneering sustainable change across the globe. We're joined by Ricky Bush, the innovative co-founder and CTO of Powertrust. His platform is revolutionizing how giants like Netflix and Salesforce procure energy through fostering sustainable micro-projects in the developing world. Together, we explore each of these regions' most impactful climate narratives of the year and delve into the global sustainability community's efforts to equip societies in developing countries to address the formidable challenges presented by climate change. These were a series of fascinating discussions, conversations that you won't want to miss. Ricky, thank you so much for joining us here, to, here today at the Yale School of Management and uh, spend, spend some time talking to us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. So today's theme is climate um, going global. So climate solutions going global. Um, you are founder, chief technical technology officer of a um, technology business that is trying to, to make real impacts on the world. Um, but before we start, um, could you give me in one sentence um, a summary of the, the, the headline from your sector for 2023? I would say it's that corporate-led voluntary renewable procurement remains a significant driver for grid decarbonization globally. Okay, and um, what do you mean by that? What we've seen is that um, a lot of corporates are establishing net zero and 100% renewable energy consumption targets. Mm -hmm. And to achieve those, they are starting to help capitalize and finance new renewable energy projects. Before, it used to be utilities and governments that were often um, establishing targets and mandates, and that was what was actually um, driving new capacity. And we've seen the pendulum now shift towards the voluntary market, where that's been the, the primary driver. And so, you know, over the last year, uh, in 2022, I think corporates were responsible for something like 70% of all renewable capacity in the United States. And this year alone, in, in Q2, um, the amount of, of commitments increased by 60% over the same quarter in the last year. And so we've seen this phenomenal growth in corporate-led procurement. Fantastic. So now, your, your speciality, and we'll, we'll, we'll go and uh, talk about uh, power, uh, power Trust in a moment. Uh, one of the pitches, which I think kind of frames what you do quite well, that, that, that I've heard you talk about, is the impact of renewables um, in developing nations is three to six times uh, what it is in, in, in developed nations, like, like the United, United States or Europe. Um, what's, what, what did you mean, Gary? Could you break, break that down a little bit for us? Mm. Yeah. When we think about the climate impact of renewable energy, it's really about what are we displacing or avoiding. And for us, that means how do we go after the most fossil intensive grids or areas that are unelectrified that are relying on very dirty fuels like kerosene or, or diesel. And when we think about the increase or the, the increased deployment of renewable energy in those markets, if we can displace uh, you know, an old diesel generator or a, an old uh, coal plant, then the climate impact is significantly higher than if we're putting it in a market that has a lot of hydro or already has a lot of renewable energy. And so when we look at the carbon intensity of say the US or Europe versus a South Africa or an in India, um, the megawatt that we deploy in South Africa has a significantly higher carbon impact, carbon avoidance impact than that megawatt does in California or in Europe. Okay, um, but yet 95% of all uh, PPAs uh, signed, signed over the last year or so have been from developed uh, economies rather than developing economies. Why, if the need and the multiplier effect is so much higher in, in, in developing worlds, uh, why is it not happening? I think there are two reasons. One is that the, the phenomenon of, of corporates establishing net zero targets and, and really driving renewable energy uh, purchases is fairly recent. It came in about the, the mid-2010s when um, there was the release of the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. 
And that was really when we saw an upswing in corporate procurement. Um, I think naturally when companies start establishing targets, the first place that they look to is their home markets. Mm -hmm. And so that often tended to be the US and in Europe. The other key factor was that those markets had regulatory frameworks in place that allowed these companies to actually procure renewable energy bilaterally. So we saw a, a, a massive increase in power purchase agreements where corporates were bilaterally agreeing to secure electricity and the renewable energy credits that came from solar plants or, or wind farms in the US and in Europe. And that was really where most of their focus has been. Um, but now I think they're starting to think about how do we address our overseas emissions um, from our overseas operations. And increasingly, we are starting to see an interest in addressing scope three emissions. And so maybe I could quickly step so, aside and talk about the, the scopes of emissions. And so when a corporate looks at its, its overall footprint, it divides it into three categories. We have scope one, which is emissions that come from operations inside the fence, as we call it, uh, direct operations where they're burning fuel, for example, for a process, and that creates emissions. Scope two are indirect emissions. Those are emissions that relate to electricity consumption where they don't have direct control over the grid mix, and so they're relying on whatever that mix happens to be and are um, then accounting for those emissions that way. And scope three is a, a catch-all bucket, effectively. It's everything else. It's emissions related to manufacturing and supply chain, uh, emissions related to product and service use. And before, that was a, a really hard, thorny issue to, to tackle. And it still remains a very hard issue to tackle, in part because the, the data transparency, the, the ability to actually um, calculate what that is remains opaque. Um, that said, I think companies are now realizing that for them to make credible progress against their net zero commitments, they need to start thinking about what that means to address that scope three mission. And that naturally means turning to emerging markets where most of their supply chain is located. And so that I think has started to uh, increase the interest in corporates to look at options available to procure renewable energy in these markets. Right. And so that's you know, really nicely summing up you know, the, the issue and the problem there. And uh, you, would you like to talk about the, the solution, the innovation that you've, you yourself and your business have come up with to try and assist corporates doing this? Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so we started PowerTrust to, to act as a, a managed marketplace between corporates that have these net zero commitments that are looking to purchase renewable energy in markets to address their emissions and renewable energy developers in these, uh, in these emerging markets that are looking for finance to build new capacity. Mm -hmm. um, before I dive a little bit deeper, maybe I can talk about, about the idea of climate finance in renewable energy. Um, so when we think about a solar plant, um, a solar plant actually produces two commodities. You have the electricity, the kilowatt hour that it produces, and there's an intangible, tradable commodity that, that, that also gets generated, what we call the renewable energy credit. And that essentially encapsulates the environmental benefit that that zero carbon solar energy is producing. Um, and the genesis of that really was it, from, a, from a compliance standpoint, when governments started mandating utilities to secure a certain amount of renewable energy, um, they needed to find a way to track how much energy was actually being purchased. Of course, we can't track electrons. And so they created this intangible unit that was associated with the megawatt hour that was produced from the solar system. Really, in the, in the 2010s, when I mentioned when the greenhouse gas protocol came out, and corporate started getting into this, the, um, the game of procuring renewable energy, that's when they adopted the renewable energy certificate as the underlying mechanism that they would use to account for their renewable energy purchases. And so that's really what, what we work in. We essentially transact in renewable energy credits. Okay. Um, and that is uh, a key financing lever that, that developers in the US and Europe have used, um, but is actually a, quite a nascent instrument when it comes to solar developers in places like Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and part of that is because a lot of the regulatory frameworks that developed here in the US and Europe that used RECs um, as a way to account for RPSs or renewable portfolio standards um, didn't really exist in these markets. And so um, it's, a, it's a slow adoption curve at the moment. We're in the early stages of really um, bringing awareness to, this, to, to the idea of a renewable energy certificate and climate finance more broadly in, in renewable energy um, and uh, working with developers to, to help them build new projects and those projects that then generate those RECs can then be sold to corporates to account for their emissions. Okay, great. And who issues the RECs? <clears throat> Um, so we work with an international body called the International Renewable Energy Standard. Mm -hmm. um, they provide the governance framework that is used to issue RECs in about 45 different countries. Um, RECs are, are, are issued based on, on a, a framework that's established kind of regionally. So in the U.S., individual states often have their own REC frameworks. In, in Europe, we have the Guarantee of Origin, um, which establishes the process by which data is verified. And from that is then, um, from which RECs are then issued. Um, the International REC standard essentially has a, a, a similar mandate, 
um, but works in, in many countries in, in Africa, uh, Latin America, and, and Asia. And so we essentially have developed a system that allows us to automate the process by which we collect data, certify that data, and then issue RECs, um, which we can then sell to corporates um, for their accounting purposes. Okay, interesting. Um, I know we have, in the kind of environmental space over the last year, one of the big headlines has been a total, well, near total collapse in confidence of the voluntary carbon markets uh, because of quite a lot of you know, bad practices, trees that were planted that were supposed to be supposed to be uh, taking down carbon for like 20 years and you know they, they, they were just neglected and six months later later they weren't there. Um, and there's been been a, like a crisis of confidence within within that that voluntary market. Why is the Rex market different, and what lessons mm -hmm. have you you know could you perhaps learn from this? Yeah. Mm. So let's start by saying that RECs are fundamentally different than carbon credits in that RECs are not trying to prove a counterfactual. With a carbon credit, you have to say, this is what would have happened without the intervention. And the intervention then results in the issuance of carbon credits, and, and that's what's transacted. But proving a counterfactual can be difficult because you're hypothesizing that you know, this would have occurred. With a REC, it's binary. It, it, did you generate the electricity or not? And I think the carbon markets are actually just shifting to a similar outcome-based orientation where it's moving away from uh, nature-based solutions and more towards um, aspects like direct air capture and carbon removal, where again, it's a binary outcome, right? It's a, did you actually sequester the carbon or not? Um, and so I think RECs inherently start from a, from a standpoint of being more verifiable. Now that said, there has been some criticism that's been leveled at the REC markets to say that they're not actually driving decarbonization. And to some degree, that is true. Um, if you are a corporate and you are buying renewable energy credits from a, a 50 year old hydro plant, that in no way is actually accelerating decarbonization. Um, and so with Power Trust, what we've done is we've developed a, a forward REC contract that essentially allows a corporate to commit to buying RECs. We then go and find projects that align with that corporate's purchase criteria. We then commit to the developer to say that we will buy RECs once you finance this project. Um, they then use that as a, as a revenue guarantee to then go find financing, get that project built. Uh, it then connects to our digital platform, which is what we use to issue RECs um, to deliver to the corporates um, and, and, and kind of complete the circle of that. And so now the corporate can say with, with confidence that their commitment actually led to the creation of new capacity on the ground. Um, the other thing I'll note is that um, we're starting to see the, the notion of additionality come into the conversation with Rex. And it's something that's been borrowed from the carbon market where, again, if your only output is the carbon credit, then you need to ensure that that carbon credit is actually making a project happen that would not have occurred otherwise. With Rex and, and renewable energy, it's a little bit different because you are selling the, the kilowatt hour still. And so uh, you need to find projects where the, the REC revenue actually has a material financial impact on that project's viability to get it built and to ensure that it remains in operation. Um, and so what we at PowerTrust do is we work with the developer to determine uh, that, that threshold and to ensure that when we commit uh, to purchase RECs for, for several years to then sell to those corporates, um, that, that that revenue is material to them getting the financing to actually get the project built. Fantastic. And your focus is on um, smaller systems in, in developing the developing, That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we focus primarily on distributed renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one is, is it, it is very difficult to build large-scale power plants in, in many of these markets. It's hard to get the land. If you get the land to, to get the materials in, then to evacuate the power, to interconnect with the grid. Um, so often these projects can take several years. Um, with distributed room energy, we're talking about rooftop solar, off-grid mini-grids, um, community solar, smaller systems that are easier to deploy, easier to interconnect. Um, but they often don't have the same level of access to financing that utility-scale projects do. And, and so with climate finance and RECs, we think that's a key lever that we can bring to these smaller scale projects. The other thing I'll notice that with a lot of these markets, we're seeing tremendous growth in, in electricity consumption. And so these countries are facing pressure to now increase access to electricity, which means investing in the grid, which as we know, based on, on the US and Europe case studies, it's very expensive. Um, I think distributed renewable energy provides an opportunity to right size grid investments, because we can now think about putting a generation assets close to load, and then not oversizing the grid, but really incorporating those DRE assets as a part of the overall grid solution. And so now it's not about sizing your grid for the six hours in the summer when everyone turns on their air conditioner, it's about sizing it for a higher utilization and then using the distributed assets as a key dispatchable asset 
to then serve that, that peak power. And I think that when you look at a, a, a cost perspective, um, I think it, it, it is a much more economic proposition than building the grid as we've done here. Um, and so I think there's an, an alternative that we would like to kind of put forward and, and to accelerate. Um, and if you look at various estimates from, from the bodies like the IEA, they say that DRE has the potential to be something like 50% of, of total global solar installs. Mm. But that's a forecast. Uh, there are a lot of conditions that have to happen to, in order to make that, that, that occur. And, and I think what we are looking to do at PowerTrust is to, is to uh, play a role in, in accelerating that, that transition. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it's a wonderful project and wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, I'd imagine there would be relatively easier, more difficult places, places to be doing this. And you seem to have chosen some of the most difficult places in the world to be, to be trying to do this. Um, what was the motivation be, uh, towards trying to, to assist um, these kind of remote, remote communities um, that leapfrogging? Like why, 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 and why did you pick particular countries and particular yeah. countries? Well, I, I, I was able to see firsthand how energy can be transformational in these communities. Um, back in grad school, I, I went on a project where we were looking at um, deploying ultrasounds in, in remote clinics um, in places like uh, Tanzania and, and Bangladesh. And um, so we're working with a healthcare company to, to establish a, a market entry um, strategy for them. And the challenge, the first challenge that we noticed was that it wasn't anything dealing with the, the training or the staff or the equipment, it was the lack of power. Um, and so we would have a, a portable ultrasound that we would bring to a clinic and it would have two hours of battery. Um, and you would yet have you know, women that would have traveled for days um, to, to come and, and actually uh, receive care. And, and so to me, that was an eye opener in that um, we, are, um, we have the ability to, to make a substantial impact um, in these communities with fairly minimal investment. Um, and I think distributed energy, particularly given that the cost curves have come down for, for solar and for storage, I think is a more economic proposition for us to address these communities. Um, and I think that's really where our mission comes from at, at Power Trust is to really try and accelerate projects that have outsized climate and social impact by going after areas that we think are underserved um, and building a bridge between these traditional energy markets and, and developers that are doing phenomenal work on the ground in getting these communities and, and building solutions. Right. And you have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, signed a significant contract with Salesforce recently. Yeah, just a, as an example of how this works in reality, like uh, on the ground, could you, could you tell us a little bit about how the, the details of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, yeah, we did. Uh, we were lucky enough to sign a, a multi-year agreement with Salesforce to, to help support new renewable energy installations in Brazil and in Ghana, India, and several countries in, in Southeast Asia. Um, maybe I can unpack that looking at two sides of the equation. So we have the, the corporate side first, which is looking at the how do I achieve my net zero commitments or my renewable energy targets? And they really have four modalities that are available to them if I want to actually procure renewable energy credits. The first is I can build on site. If I've got a roof, I can put solar on my roof. Um, I can go work by utility um, to secure renewable energy through, say, a green tariff. Um, the third option, which we often hear about, is the power purchase agreement. Um, and then the last piece is the unbundled REC. Um, that's often the first thing that companies do when they're looking to make progress against their commitments. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's been some concern around the quality of, of RECs. That said, they still play a very significant role in the market. Um, if you look at the share of, of, of purchasing unbundled RECs versus the other modalities, it remains the majority strategy for most companies. Um, and so, but at the same time, we do know that we have to evolve that model from simply buying RECs from a 50-year-old hydro plant to one that has clear additionality. And so with Salesforce, we work together to build the commercial and contractual frameworks that would allow us to then go and source projects in these markets, um, provide that, that promise to buy uh, RECs when they're generated over several years at a fixed price, um, and help the developers then use that to get financing. And Salesforce gets those RECs, which are additional, they're verified, and they can use that against their, their climate commitments. From the developer standpoint, in a lot of these markets, it's very difficult to get financing, particularly if you're a distributed solar developer working in, in a remote area um, or working in, in disadvantaged communities. And so often they're facing high costs of capital. Um, there's concern around the off-taker's ability to pay. Um, they often incur costs in US dollars, but are earning revenue in local currency, so they have foreign exchange exposure. Um, and so they're facing many, many challenges. And what we did with Salesforce was we established this, this multi-year framework that essentially provides the developer a fixed price in US dollars over several years. And that allows them to then go get that financing because now they have not just a, a offtake um, from a credit-worthy offtaker, 
but it's in U.S. dollars, mm. uh, in a stable currency. And so that provides them uh, a level of confidence where they can now actually go and, and, and secure financing and operate in some of these environments. And it's a, pro a model that we hope will, will, will scale up um, as, we, as companies now think about how do I drive more impact to my procurement, how do I drive additionality, and still address my emissions in some of these markets where a lot of the models that they're used to, like power purchase agreements, aren't really available. Understand. So that's that kind of links to the next point, which is: um, is are the recs themselves enough to be financing the projects, or do you still need to be getting a price for the electricity as well? Yeah, we've mm. we've noticed that the recs uh, the recs by themselves don't entirely finance the project. The developer still needs to bring a little bit of equity. They're still primarily financed by by uh, senior debt, um, but oftentimes that 10 to 15 percent revenue, or, or perhaps 20 percent revenue that can come from a rec, can be substantial. And when you incorporate that in the financial models, it can, it can have a significant impact on the project's IRRs. Um, we're also actually exploring a model where we can bring capital up front for the project. Um, so we'll soon be announcing uh, the launch of a blended capital facility that will help us put capital in the project stack up front. So rather than paying a developer, as we call it, upon delivery, where they, you know, we pay them once the REC is issued, we'll provide them several years worth of RECs up front. And so they can use that capital to reduce their debt requirements, um, which, is, as we know, in these markets, debt is very expensive uh, and dramatically impacts the project's viability. And so that's, an, that's the model that we're looking to introduce now, where we'll have a much more material impact on the project's ability to get started um, and further reinforce that argument around additionality. So you add an extra kind of 15, 20 percent of income to a project uh, can, in, yeah. in, in an emerging market that and they wouldn't otherwise have access to RECs if it wasn't for That's your right. technology. A, a lot okay. of the incentives um, don't really exist in some of these markets. Mm -hmm. There are no tax credits. Um, there's no feed-in tariff. Um, and so RECs are effectively stepping in as, as a public subsidy for, yeah. these, um, for these projects. So. Um, in addition to like all the all the the, the clear benefits that uh, that this can bring, and it also strikes me that there's a risk, and the risk is that uh, when you are looking at when a company um, or as a country is looking to count its own carbon, it does so within its own borders. Um, and like all of the the accounting uh, mechanisms are within within kind of national national borders national frameworks, uh, with some kind of cross border car carbon charging. Um, with this potential kind of internationalization, globalization of, um, of, of carbon, it strikes me you, you're going to need some safeguards to just stop, um, like for example, any kind of green benefits just being kind of passed across to, 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 um, to um, developed countries. Um, and also if you end up losing your ability to count and understand uh, what's going on, doesn't, wouldn't that kind of create a potential for slowing down transitions? So I, I think that energy is going to remain um, a local concern. Um, so unlike carbon, where as you mentioned, Chris, you can trade carbon credits across boundaries. I think for the most part, the rules and the regulations and the guidance will be that if you uh, support uh, help support renewable energy or, or purchase a renewable energy certificate, that it has to be accounted for within that country's boundaries. Um, so you cannot use a REC that you generate in Ghana against your electricity consumption emissions in California. Um, that said, I think there is a realization that not all megawatt hours are equal um, and that a megawatt hour in California might actually displace existing solar, but a megawatt hour in South Africa is going to displace coal. And so when we think holistically about how we should focus our efforts on, on um, increasing renewable energy penetration, we should focus on those markets that are underserved or that are fossil intensive. Um, and to, to that end, I think we are starting to see corporates um, look at the emissions factors that are related to, to energy consumption or energy production and, and not just sort of the geographic boundaries. And I do think there's a value in that because a, part of the challenge that, that we see is that a lot of these underserved markets like Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of corporates don't necessarily have strong direct presence. And so if you take the, the rules at face value, then there's no real incentive for them to then go and establish and accelerate renewable energy usage in these markets. Um, so we think there is, there is a, a opportunity to, to shift some of the focus um, beyond the, the, the national boundaries. And I, and I do think that will remain a, a primary way for corporates to account for their electricity consumption, but then shift some portion of their procurement to some of these higher needs markets, because ultimately we need to understand what we're solving for. We're solving for a global climate crisis. Um, we're all breathe the same air. And so if we address the problem locally, but 
some of these markets continue to develop with very fossil intensive grids or solutions, then we haven't actually solved anything. And so we think that there's an opportunity to really bring new focus to these, these markets. Um, and I think corporates can play a catalytic role um, given their position uh, in some of these, these domains. And I also think that from a, from a business perspective, you know, that's where the growth is. Um, that's where GDP growth is, that's where population growth is, that's where electricity consumption growth is. Um, and so it behooves these companies to, to build a presence in these markets. And one clear way to do that is to help support renewable energy growth. Great answer, yeah, thank you. Um, and what, something else that you support isn't just about renewable energy growth. You're, you're also um, quite proud of uh, you not just looking at renewable energy, but also other kind of sustainable develop, development goals. Can you tell us a little, little bit about uh, that and helping yeah. local communities? I, I think, if I, if I can borrow a, a financial analogy, I think when we think about energy, we often think of the sell side, about capacity, megawatts, uh, you know, and the climate impact. And we don't often think about the buy side, the demand piece of it. But ultimately, electricity is a commodity. It's being used to do something. Um, and when we think about the value of energy, um, we often think, of, again, in a siloed place of, well, there's a wholesale market, or the energy is worth this much, and it costs this much to produce, and therefore we should market it you know, at this value. And less about, well, what, is it, what are we actually enabling? Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly in these underserved markets, I think there's a lot of value we can bring by taking a more holistic approach to valuing that electricity. Uh, and I'll give you an example, Chris. So we're, we're working with um, a, a nonprofit called the Global Surgical Initiative, uh, or GSI. Um, their goal is to essentially increase access to surgery for the five billion people across the world that, that don't have access to elective surgery. Um, they recently opened a, a facility in Uganda, in rural Uganda, that is providing elective surgeries to the surrounding area. It runs off grid, um, so it's entirely powered by, by solar and storage. Um, and so from a, a climate finance perspective, you could say, well, we'll just source the RECs from there, right? And we'll pay for the REC value. Um, but if you take a slightly more expansive view, the, the, those RECs are helping support a solar system that is enabling doctors to now perform procedures, right? Um, and so the model that we're looking to pilot is what we call empowered social impact. It's one that takes the REC and also takes the health outcomes that are directly related to that REC. There's a clear causal relationship between I produced electricity, I was therefore able to do the service uh, for the patient, and I generated this particular health outcome. Um, and to essentially now package that as a, as a bundle that we can now help finance clinical operations with. Um, and so this is one where we have a clear correlation, causation, you know, between the energy and the outcome. And I think that model is applicable to things like uh, agriculture as well where we have lots of um, small farmholders that are looking to increase their, their productivity, um, where there's a clear sort of relationship between access to energy, availability of energy, of clean energy, and, and what they can do with that. Um, and so if we're able to now take a, that, that more holistic picture, I think we can start bringing additional value to these markets. So it's not just about the electricity produced, it's about what are we enabling to happen. Brilliant, yeah, no, that's a very powerful answer, uh, thank you. So just as one last question, you know, sitting here in um, you know, the Yale School of Management, it seems uh, rude not to ask, uh, what do you feel was the, the biggest um, impact of you know, the program has on, on you know, the last couple of years? Yeah, well, the, the nice thing about the Financing Deploying Clean Energy Program um, at Yale is that it, it brings a, a diverse set of folks together who have a common purpose and mission, right, which is to, mm -hmm. to accelerate the energy transition, the just energy transition. Um, and I think part of the value is in really connecting with people in different markets, in different roles, in different parts of the industry, um, and to, to find those connections, those loose connections. Um, you know, I have the opportunity of working with actually two folks in my cohort, um, one in, in Vietnam and one in India, who are working on the energy transition in those markets. And of course, it naturally ties to what we're doing, which is to increase the energy transition in those markets. Um, and so I think there's, there's a, a tremendous sort of loose correlation that can, that can happen or, um, with these programs uh, to, to bring people together because we all have that common mission. And I think that's, that's a powerful driving force um, and I think it's, it's one that, that uh, I'm looking forward to as the program grows and, and, and continues to get interest um, to kind of see foster. Great. That's Ricky. That was great. Thank great. you. Thank, thank so you much. so much. Thank you.